So, hello everyone. Welcome on board to another episode of Thursday Tea Time at 3.30, the antidote to interminable Zoom seminars where we get everything done in 30 minutes. Later on, we'll hear from two great solution partners from our portfolio, talking about how to engage with customers in a cookie world and how to ensure that your content captivates and engages your audience. Firstly, for those of you who don't know us, we exist because there's too much shit out there. What that means is corporates are bombarded by a tsunami of often irrelevant solutions from vendors who are incapable of selling. We are a group of over 50 aging C-level folk who've made it our ambition to curate solutions and services for corporates which make a genuine difference, all wrapped up in our own irreverent, no-nonsense approach. And our portfolio of over 30 solutions from scale-ups around the world encompasses stuff which deliver actionable insights, enhance marketing and comms capabilities, drive engagement and ensure that staff are taken care of and have a voice. And we're delighted to be supported by the spiffing folk from our sponsors Hayes McIntyre and Lewis Silkin who are happy to share useful legal and financial content and free advice with you, our lovely audience. One company we particularly admire, which demonstrated an ability to recognise the need to adapt and actually did something about it, is PepsiCo. And we're thrilled to be, to be joined today by David Schwartz, who is in charge of innovation and tech venturing. David, uh, welcome on board. I, I suppose, quick question first, surely a company as big as PepsiCo should have no trouble to embrace innovation? <laughs> That's a great question, Alex. I wish that was true, although uh, I think that gives me job security, all the challenges we have. <laughs> so um, thank you for having me. And uh, maybe I'll start off just give a little bit of story about PepsiCo, because I think people often associate PepsiCo with the Pepsi brand. So I'll share some fun facts and then go right to the question you asked, which is a perfect question. Um, how do we do innovation at PepsiCo? Uh, so first, some fun facts. PepsiCo is... Um, the largest food and beverage company in the United States. We have one of the largest private fleets of trucks in the world, 23 brands with over a billion dollars of sales, over 265,000 employees. It, it's really big. And I'm not here to market PepsiCo, but just be very pragmatic of we're such a big company to innovate is really hard. You have so much technology from the seed that's proprietary that goes in the ground all the way to the shelf. And we manage every part of that supply chain. So you can imagine changing how we do things or bringing new innovation is really challenging. I think the next page really brings us to life where I'm going to try to add some practical elements to everyone on the, on the call so they could feel connected to what we're sharing. And if they're corporates on, I imagine we might have some commonalities here. But the first challenge is we're often, we're fragmented. We're a big business. We have business units in over 200 countries and many initiatives, often overlapping initiatives. And I think one interesting thing for any startup that's on the call is as you speak to leaders in PepsiCo or anywhere, just to understand, are they the right person to lead that initiative? Because you might speak to someone with a great title, but are they living and dying for the success of your startup? And is it in their PDR, their review of what they have to achieve that year. Second is we could be a little slow, where I guess for a startup for PepsiCo or other corporates, a day is a week, a week is a month, a month is a year. And sometimes what we think is really fast, you might have a slightly different opinion. And one thing that might be practical that I think many startups could, could leverage or use is understanding the AOP budget. So we, every year we get a budget to do pilots and to scale companies. And sometimes a company might be going a little slower because the money isn't there till the following year. So really important, not just to present who you are and what you could do, but where's the budget right now? And that can impact innovation. The third is on the external connectivity. Because we are so large, we have so many partners, many people have relationships and say, oh, I have the best company. I'm gonna send it to the president of this or the VP there. And then inconsistent companies start coming throughout the business. What we've done is we said, let's switch that around. What's the need in the business? And then what can we, where can we find the best solution around the world or solutions to help solve that problem? So I think one thing that could be helpful for a startup, I think, is to understand and help educate sometimes the big company 
what are the solutions out there? What makes your technology so different and so relevant to a company like PepsiCo when we have many different companies coming in from different angles? And last is a challenge to monetize. How do we find a win-win? What's a win-win that you, the startup, could really succeed, but we, PepsiCo, could succeed together? And don't be shy to negotiate that. I think the next page, therefore, brings to life why, while we have these challenges, what our leadership thought would be really helpful for PepsiCo. And many of the executives said, let's put a team together, and this is what I've built, that could really be that bridge or that link between the external world and the internal PepsiCo world. So we have three areas. One is we systematically engage the external ecosystem, where we go around and our responsibility is to build relationships. Gray hair is a perfect example where we had a challenge, Alex, we just met a few weeks ago, and already you shared two startups, and they were, yes, yesterday alone, one of them you'll meet today, were presenting to over 20 or 30 PepsiCo executives, really going to the core of what we said on the earlier page, people will make decisions and will live and die for the success of these solutions. The second is we just want to accelerate pilots. So how do we get rid of the bureaucracy? While well, you think it's so easy, oh, I'll go to a big company and they'll just do a pilot, what's a big deal? There are a lot of rules we have. Because we're so large and we have such a vital supply chain to provide food safely to people, any solution we have, we just have a tolerance level of safety, security, uh, protecting um, personal information. And therefore, we try to make it accelerate where you could do a pilot enough to prove the concept and we could do enough to keep safe yet still make things happen quickly. And last is negotiation. It's very hard. There's procurement and there's other teams. We've taken a procurement from a vendor relationship to actually a friendship. How can we really win together versus how do we take a supplier and try to get every penny we can get out of them? Not that we would do that, but it's how to really take that to a win-win opportunity. And therefore, this really brings up the model that we've created. The model is, and I'll try to bring this to life as well. It seems so simple, yet it's not as simple as it looks. Four steps we have. And innovation is never linear, but I'll say it's as linear as could be for us. Step number one is to find the business need. And I'd suggest this for anyone listening on the call. When you hear a business need, first, we, the company, ask us the questions. Are you really clear in what you're trying to solve? Because if we're not, please push us and keep pushing to get that clear. But then I'd ask a question on the other side as well. When you bring a solution, what need are you solving? And specifically, what action will you change in PepsiCo? So imagine you have a solution that could set, make us smarter, could find out more information about a shopper. Great, so good to know. We also have a lot of data. What action will happen differently in PepsiCo based on your solution? That's where you're really addressing a need versus having another interesting idea. Second is discover the best solutions. This is where we look out and we look really broadly across the ecosystem. What are the best solutions out there? And many companies will come and say, well, we're the best. You don't have to speak to anyone else, right? Like, what, what's the problem? It is true. I am sure each and every one of you are the best, but we also want to understand what are the different pros and cons between different solutions. So sometimes we'll do a pilot side by side of two complementary solutions. Sometimes we'll help them even work together because then one plus one equals 10 to find the best solution. But my suggestion is be open of why you're relevant and how you're different than all the other solutions out there. And also be open, what do you still have to develop? We have two types of companies that come. Some that are like, we solve the world, we have no problems, and we're just gonna show you how great we are. And some say, I think we solve the world or we have, but we still have some areas that we'd love to work together with you. And I think the more open you are, the better we can discover the best solutions and the better we could do step three, which is pilot your solution. Because if the bar is here and what you deliver is here, there's gonna be a gap. But imagine if the bar is here and together we elevate it to here, it's a win-win for you and a win-win for us. That's what our team is. We're here to partner with you because what we've learned is startups, maybe most of you, but I imagine most of you want one of three things. You either want funding to help fund your business, you want expertise to make your business better, and or you want scale so you could really take it all over the world. We at PepsiCo could really offer you the scale. We could offer you the expertise. If needed, money could also come into play, but often that, that's not the highest priority. 
The, the last part is we could also offer is exactly this, where we then do this, we go to scale, we bring your solution around the world. But we can, sorry, we have the potential to bring your solution around the world, but we want to assess how good you are and how much of a fit you are for what we need. And the reason is, I think we want to set you up for success as much as we want to succeed. And therefore, I thought it's good just to take one layer off the covers. There are many layers underneath it, but some of the elements we look for when we work with startups. One of the areas is commonly it's the maturity of the business. Do you have a foundation? Do you have enough funding? Do you have partners that can really help you succeed? The second is, do you, what's your strategic relevance to what PepsiCo is trying to solve? Specifically, how are your, are your economics? Is it a win-win? And the numbers do matter. And it's not necessarily just numbers though. It could be sustainability. It could be brand love but it's understanding what those KPIs are and how they're mutually important. And third is your willingness to partner. It becomes very clear, just like we, and I take it on myself, I and we have to prove ourselves to you of what we could offer. We ask you to also think in the mindset, how could you partner with us? If I'd suggest a way of doing that is the magic wands question. And I often ask it in many of our, our startup discussions, if you had a magic wand and you could have any type of relationship with PepsiCo, what would that look like? Beyond the vendor startup, the vendor supplier relationship, really the partnership mindset, what's in your magic wand? And there's often a pause of, wow, we didn't think of that. But I'd encourage you as you build a relationship, we are people, we are personal, we're not just a big name. How would you want to build that partnership both on a personal level, on a professional level, and a company level? And last is the capability. I imagine all of you would imagine all three of these elements, but first getting under the hood, how good is your technology? What differentiates it from the other technologies and what we're trying to solve together? Second is how user friendly is it? No matter how good the technology is, we need that user friendliness so we can get adoption. Because you live, in, we, we all live and die by the success of getting the, the tool to be adopted. And last is scalability. Can we scale this around the world or to multiple business units, multiple functions, multiple parts of our business. Because if it solves one specific thing in one country for one brand, it's great and we could connect you with that country, but I think it's a better win-win when we have such little time in your lives and our lives to find something where we could really win together. So I would summarize, Alex, what we're trying to do is be personal, build relationships with you, understand our need, rapidly test with quick go no go decisions so we don't waste e your time and then when it works let's build a partnership together david that's absolutely fantastic thank you very much there are plenty of learnings there for everyone do, would you do you feel that in the last six months with all the changes that has happened around the world that this approach to innovation has become even more important are you seeing more support from sort of um, the senior leadership team in engaging? Yes, oh, that's a great question. I, I, I imagine many of you have gotten that WhatsApp, what's caused change in your company, the CEO, the CTO or COVID? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's always like COVID. It's been a great experience for us. I think COVID is a very serious thing that we all take, um, we do not take lightly and we wanna help keep the safety both of our employees and all of our partners but it also has created an urgency for change. How do we adapt that we could safely deliver food to people all over the world so that they could get that, that um, product, nutrition, beverage, snack to them, no matter where they are. And therefore creativity has been essential for us and um, doing it the right way. Fantastic. Well, I'm, I can't thank you enough for, for joining us in today. And interestingly, when you started, you mentioned that at, at the moment this week you're in the process of seeing some companies which you've identified which might help you move forwards and one of those in fact you alluded to was Beamray and what I'd love to do at this stage is um, bring in Raman from Beamray to uh, tell us a little bit about what Beamray can do and why it's so relevant. Thank you, thank you Alex and David, great to see you again. Uh, great insights that I didn't previously have, so thank you very much for those. Um, hi guys, my name is Raman from Beamray, and uh, we are a Moments AI. Talking through why we exist, um, 
This is a quote taken from Don Draper, um, but it effectively describes most of the problems that we have with advertising today. That we base all of our decisions based on what happened previously. And we at Beamray are looking to help brands base their decisions on what's happening right now. So I'd like to talk through some of the problems in the industry that's facing today. And the first one is that 90% of the open web very soon will be unknown. And this is a problem related to identity, uh, as we may be seeing today that cookies are being deprecated. The same will follow through in mobile advertising IDs. Cookies, IDs, and PII, which enable tracking and tracing of, of people, uh, will all come to an end. This links into the second problem. And the second problem is that data platforms and providers don't recognize unknowns. So the use cases brands currently have today with data management and data targeting, all of which relies on cookies, IDs, and PII, will also come to an end. And this relates to the third problem, one which has always been there, but kind of pushed away, um, that human behavior has far deeper layers. We aren't just all demographics. There are lots of other signals which are relevant to how we do things, emotions, moods, and motivations. And that's effectively what Beamray helps brands tap into alongside the traditional metrics. So Beamray is a next generation data infrastructure that delivers the competitive edge with signals and AI. That's live signals coming from user interactions. Uh, and as such, we help transform your data driven marketing whilst reducing all risk around ethics, privacy, and trust. Using signals and AI, we improve the way brands, media, and advertising systems interact with people. And our solutions fuse behavioral psychology, neural networks, active deep learning algorithms, and collective intelligence to enable relevant, timely, likable advertising in meaningful moments. And these are three of the main outcomes that we enable. People process efficiency, enhance existing whilst creating new products and services, and improve decisions making with actionable insights. Which uh, means that brands are able to win hearts and minds with relevant advertising. And they're able to identify their customers without identifiers. And in turn, maximize marketing effectiveness without cookies, IDs, and PII. And these are just some of the results that we're seeing from our testing thus far. Thank you. Raman, thanks very much. Uh, David, any, any questions? A couple, first of all, great job. A couple of questions. Um, it's great to hear you twice in two days. We, uh, <laughs> it furthers the message, love it. And well done both times. Thank you. This one's a lot shorter and sharper, I guess. Yeah, <laughs> yes. Um, so, so two questions come to mind. The first is brands, they have to think about plan media, plan media in general differently. Why is this the best approach? And I'll get a little even more specific. Are there other ways to target and personalize without PII and cookie data? Yes, um, so I'd say simply put, um, the way in which we have planned media um, has been a cyclical approach um, based on periodic engagements, which means we get started, we forecast, and then we launch the campaigns with lots of complications involved in between, comes to a stop, and we take some learnings onto the next one. Um, our approach means that brands are able to take on an always on approach for identifying those moments, meaning that they're always listening for and engaging in the moments that matter. And as such, they can optimize other parts of their business, such as the creative assets that they want to be able to deploy in those moments as they change over time. Um, and as such, there's a lot of signals um, outside of cookies that enable this moment driven targeting. Um, so we are able to replicate what people are used to today, such as age, gender, household income, so on and so forth. There's lots of signals coming from the content people are looking at. People call it context today, interest, sentiment. Um, and then there's also the means to understand moods, emotions, motivations, um, as well as providing lots of customized ones just as well. So we actually think it's far more interesting without identifiers. Ah, interesting. Okay, so I'm going to ask the harder question. So from the previous presentation, we talked about piloting and scaling. Mm -hmm. It sounds like it sounds potentially like it could be complicated. 
how easy or hard is it for business and brand to implement, right, and test your solution? Yeah, um, I'd, I'd go back and say um, cookies are complicated uh, in their nature. Um, so that's what we've been doing so far, and it's a very complicated beast, meaning you've got one data asset and everyone's trying to add value to that through different means. In our case, the value we're adding is through a real-time system that's taking place in real time. So there's no need for lots and lots of partners, no data leakage. Um, and as such, it means that we're able to deliver those triggers into your media platforms or onto your websites, wherever you want it, very simply. And those integrations have either already been done or can easily be done going forward. Interesting. Brilliant. Okay. Well, uh, Raman, thank you uh, very much for that. Thanks uh, for your questions, David. Appreciate it. Anytime. Good well, answers. What, what I'd love to do now is uh, bring on... Oh, sorry, wrong way. I'd love to now introduce Alex from Affectiva, who's going to take a rather different approach. You might have the content and how can you adapt it and improve it to better engage with your consumers. Alex, over to you. Lovely. Thank you, Alex. So today I'm going to talk, you, talk to you about engaging consumers with captivating content. Now, the challenge, as we know, is a significant one. There's more content in more places, and that encourages the consumer behaviours of skip, block and avoid. Fundamentally, we know that we need to earn consumers' attention. It is not a given. But whilst the centrality of emotions in decision making is widely understood and accepted, understanding emotional responses with precision and accuracy is not always an area of focus for marketing or insight teams. So how can Affectiva technology help with this challenge? Well, our technology captures moment by moment emotional responses based on facial movement. And what happens is a deep learning face detector will calibrate an individual's facial features before our AI classifies 31 facial expressions, emotions and validated measures on emotional gauge, engagement and positivity. This technology is, is, is truly agnostic, uh, working within the cloud or device embedded and across different types of capture methods. So mobile, tablet, central location, all different types of scenario. But why is this important? Well, we think it's important because it gives you an insight into what consumers can't or aren't able to say themselves. A view of unfiltered and unbiased responses. So a truly system one tool of understanding. We also talk about the depth of our foundational data and there's some stats on the screen in front of you now. And this is not simply a case of, you know, a bigger number is better. Really what this is indicative of is the labeling and depth of cases, which means that we can mitigate demographic bias, control context, and ultimately deliver emotion AI insights that are unrivaled in their accuracy, ultimately giving confidence in decision making. So let's look at a, a real life case example in a, in a little bit more detail. Here we have marketing material for the latest Bond film. So it's the Bond trailer under the microscope. Uh, the lines here have been exported from our dashboard and are based on the breadth and depth of emotional positivity or valence. Bond fans are shown in the blue line from a survey measure and non-Bond fans in the pink line. So if you look to the end or the right hand side of the screen, you can see real emotional highs at the end of the content where Bond fans are being left on a high from the iconic references, the black tie, the Aston Martin car. Now that's great, but the objective of this, of, uh, of, of, of this content is to actually widen the franchise amongst non-Bond fans. And here you can see it's struggling because we have that dip in emotional positivity within the first five seconds. So look at the pink line dipping early on. And what this is indicative of is uh, viewers not understanding the background and context to the relationship that they're seeing. We also actually turn the emotion AI on Bond himself and you can see that he's quite angry and expressing negative emotions. So there's a clear action here uh, for the client to have a, a clearer emotional hook uh, without necessitating any background information. So just to wrap up, working with Affectiva, uh, what will this bring? Well, I think crucially, uh, our data is trusted and delivered at scale, so widely used and trusted. Secondly, 
uh, we have uh, a range of different creative media and executional challenges that we can give ex executional guidance on. So optimizing ads, creating different edits, aligning media spend. And then finally, uh, we're very much a tech layer. So we're led by engineers and scientists, but we pride ourselves on flexibility and partnership uh, to solve problems. Thank you. Alex, thank you very much. David, over to you. Well done, Alex. Oh, I like this one. Um, except for the logos, I'm still looking for our logo. But that's okay, we'll talk after. <laughs> <laughs> so a couple of questions. One is, I have to ask the question, coronavirus, we all know our lives are getting impacted. To what extent have a viewer's emotional response changed, right? Yeah, no, absolutely. A, a great question and a really interesting question. So what we find from looking at our advertising database is that underlying emotional responses to different types of content have fundamentally not changed. And that's even when you look at uh, you know, industry sectors, which you think may well do. So beverages, restaurants, there's no difference there also. But what's really interesting is when you look under the bonnet at the type of content and where brands are delivering content that has very either tangible or relative guidance, that is invoking a lot of emotional engagement. Where brands are delivering more generic, we're here to help type messaging, that's really not, that's falling quite flat. So there is a difference in what you're saying, but the underlying emotional response does not change. Hmm. Ah, so interesting. So I'm gonna to go to a different part, again, linking to the earlier presentation. There are a number of different facial coding technologies out there. What differentiates Effectiva? Effectiva. No, no, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, so I think, I think the simple answer is the, the depth of our science. I think that's the simple answer. And I think there are probably three strands then to that. So one from all the cases we have unrivaled accuracy. The second being that the scale and depth enables us to understand many different display rules. So in different cultural contexts, different face types, uh, we can understand that context in a lot of depth. And then finally, it's probably the final point on this slide. We're very much, uh, you know, a, a, an engineering led, science led tech company. So we really try and be absolutely flexible in what we do and what we deliver, recognizing that each challenge is unique and different. So we seek to collaborate, not, not, not sort of fully standardize everything that we're telling our clients. Well done. Brilliant, Alex, thank you very much. Um, well, as ever, we always promise we'll get everything done within 30 minutes. I really want to thank David um, today for being our keynote. We learned a lot of brilliant things from him. But one, one of the most compelling ones for me was if you are approaching a company like PepsiCo, be honest, try and understand where the business need is and actually identify where the budget is and find a win-win and don't be shy. We then heard from Beam Ray about how personalised engagement is still possible without cookies. And then finally, we just heard from Alex from Affectiva, and they, he's shown how a quarter of all the Fortune 500 companies use them to ensure that their content is appropriate uh, to drive maximum in engagement. If you missed one of our previous sessions, just let us know and we can, can give you access to a recording. Otherwise, please make a note in your diaries for the next session, October the 8th at 3.30 as ever, unless you're abroad, and then maybe it isn't. We're lucky enough to have the Head of International at Snapchat, Claire Velotti, join us, plus two solutions partners. As ever, if you want to talk to us about anything at all, just use bingo at greyhairworks.com. Thank you, as always, to our sponsors, Lewis Silkin and Hayes McIntyre. They're there to help you. And other than that, thank you, you, the audience, for attending. Many thanks. Look forward to seeing you next month. All the best, everyone. Cheerio.